हेलो थैंक यू माई हार्ट फेल्ड थैंक्स टू प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर बिथुल कुमार गुप्ता सर एंड मैम फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी इन दिस ग्रेट साइंटिफिक फिस्ट एंड टूडे माई टॉपिक इज बेसिकली एक्यूट फेवराइल इलनेस इन इमरजेंसी रूम आई सी यू दिस वॉज एक्चुअली प्रेजेंटेड इन एपिकॉन ईस्टर्न रीजन इन कटक ओरिशा एंड आफ्टर सब्सिक्वेंट आई मेट सर इन अ भुवनेश्वर वर्ल्ड डायबिटीज कांग्रेस एंड आफ्टर दैट आई टोल दैट दिस विल बी अ गुड टॉपिक सो without uh, delaying i think sessions are late so i can start so we know that acute febrile illness in emergency room and uh, icu becomes a uh, difficult when a resident or house surgeon or a pg student uh, gets the case of acute febrile illness who has got organ dysfunction not that all the fever cases are dangerous few of them they present uh, very cynically and becomes dangerous so what we should do so we know that humanity has the greatest three dangers fever famine and war and uh, of the war we know i was from army so initially so i was in kargil also but still i still say fever is much more dangerous than the war because you don't know what to deal with most of the physicians at the end of the day when they deal with fever they get always confused that whether what is the diagnosis and whether treatment is correct or not especially in acute presentation with organ dysfunction so definition fever in icu is basically a single temperature of more than 101 degree fahrenheit or 38.3 degree centigrade as per american college of critical care medicine also idsa acute febrile illness it's same uh, but uh, if it is more than 2 days this is our aims uh, delhi uh, guidelines also nowadays we are calling it acute undifferentiated fever there has been a recent surge in the patients patients uh, uh, presenting to emergency department with acute uh, febrile illness or aufi and with multi organ dysfunction syndrome this has come in our 2016 journal of clinical diagnosis epidemiology uh, we will be discussing little bit that is basically pan india if you see dengue all over uh, uh, india it is going very high earlier malaria was the main but now malaria incidence is reducing and dengue is increasing other than that scrub typhus meningitis malaria pneumonia leptospirosis while uh, preparing for this uh, i uh, studied little bit about punjab when we saw that especially southern punjab which is uh, this part of uh, punjab has got uh, uh, much more plasmodium vivax unfortunately in bishakhapatnam where i stay orissa bishakhapatnam jharkhand this part where i uh, i see a lot of patients more of falciparum or malignant uh, malaria we see less of uh, vivax and even if we are getting nowadays vivax most of the vivax malaria are Uh, very complicated vivax earlier we are not getting complicated vivax nowadays vivax has become very virulent and it behaves just like falciparum that is another thing so basically uh, as per the api guideline fever we are now managing with syndromic management undifferentiated fever fever with rash or thrombocytopenia like dengue and uh, even sometimes chikungunya also fever with joint pain like uh, chikungunya or sometimes dengue fever with acute respiratory distress you know, ards okay we have seen recently covid and fever with encephalopathy uh, with lot of viral encephalopathies or bacterial encephalopathies and fever with multi organ dysfunction this is very important and mostly we handle them in icus or emergency room so acute and different fever fever how we will approach the approach will be like uh, either malaria first do a rapid diagnostic test kit rdt malaria if it is malaria good you can manage as per the protocol if it is non malaria then it can be viral or bacterial so you have to see all the things as per the chart arbo virus influenza bacteremia it can be zoonotic it can be hepatic amebiasis amoebic liver abscess also we see and what are the differential diagnosis there is a long list dd of acute febrile illness like you have to divide like rash with shock rash and conjunctivitis and the diseases are there rash with diarrhea rash with bully like vibrio valni process gangs gas gangrene gas gangrene is very common in army setup especially bullet injuries they get into gas gangrene and similarly uh, catheter related infection like patients who are on cv catheter dialysis catheter or pacemaker they get a uh, lot of time so this chart you should just see and fever with ards with tropical disease leptospira very common especially in the uh, uh, urban bigger urban cities like bombay i was there lot of leptospira happens after monsoon okay you know that it's basically rat is the transmitting uh, genotic this thing and uh, they have two phases fourth to sixth phase you will have first a milder phase 
then there will be a gap then patient will come with acute liver failure or acute kidney injuries so and more, many of them die almost 51 percent death rate in uh, the uh, leptospirosis and they require a lot of time mechanical ventilation malaria we know that uh, falciparum malaria it can cause dyspnea uh, within hours patient can get into ARDS very fast with all the complications of malaria like backwater fever acute kidney injuries acute liver injuries scrub typhus Nowadays, a lot of streptococcus we are seeing in both Andhra, Orissa, okay. And earlier, it was most of a military disease, sub-Himalayan, most of the army troops, they used to get streptococcus. Now, it has gone into Pan-India, Bangalore also, a lot of cases, okay. So, it can cause all sorts of uh, organ dysfunction like myocarditis, encephalitis, and you know that doxycycline is a drug of choice, excellent drug, works nicely. And enteric fever, nowadays also we get complicated enteric fever, especially in Delhi region, the travelers from Delhi, drug resistant, uh, this thing and dengue fever we get headache rash myalgia arthralgia and retroorbital pain and acute dyspnea can happen in dengue and followed by ARDS that is very important that is why acute dengue fever we must see the respiratory rate and saturation every every 10 to 15 minutes we should measure the saturation it can go down anytime with ARDS so this is the fever with encephalopathy approach this is a basically journal of physicians of India JAPI journal and this is the guideline which uh, is basically there you can see it and this I do very commonly. Many a times we don't get a CT scan before doing uh, lumbar puncture. So if you have an ultrasound, we, uh, we uh, use extensively ultrasound and echo in our ICU. Okay, so what we do, we, uh, suppose we don't have a CT and we have to go for a lumbar puncture and we suspect that there may be a uh, rise in ICT, intracranial tension. So what you do, just put your uh, uh, the uh, probe on the eyeball and you can see as clearly the diagram just below the eyeball that uh, three cent three millimeter below if your optic nerve sheath diameter is more than five millimeter it is 94 percent sensitive and 87 percent specific of icp rise more than 20 millimeter so be careful if you are doing a lumbar puncture do a guarded lumbar puncture that you know how to do guarded lumbar puncture so these are the red flag signs with acute undifferentiated fever or acute febrile illness in icu so if patient has got prostration patient has got hyperpyrexia which is very common in this tropical season, especially this part. In arm force also, we get a lot of hyperpyrexia, heat stroke we call, classical heat stroke or, ex or exertional heat stroke, both. Respiration is very important. If patient has got shortness of breath or uh, saturation less than 92, and if you see the circulation failure, like capillary refill time, very, very sensitive, and very easily you can do capillary refill time. If it is more than three seconds, good. Okay, if it is more than three seconds, not good. Prognosis is good, no, not good. And capillary refill time for poor setup is very good. And neurological altered mental uh, status, abdominal pain. If any dengue patient with abdominal pain is definitely a dangerous sign, we should admit that case. Jaundice on examination of sclera, petechial rash, bleeding from any of this nose, gums, or any uh, site, venipuncture site. Again, it shows that there is coagulation abnormality. These are all uh, red flag signs. So this is basically a uh, uh, clinical chart, history of the patient and meticulous examination is very important. Examination of all the systems in acute febrile illness is very important. So this we cannot emphasize more. Disease specific clinical profiles we should see, like if you see uh, the first case detection by Dr. Arun from Kerala, with the first patient only, the first uh, patient only he could diagnose, he could suspect it is NIPA and subsequently when the test was done in virology lab and confirmed at Bangalore, uh, that national, sorry, NIV at Pune, it was found to be the first case of NIPA. And our Dr. Arun and team, they got a lot of awards also for that. And we must have a national database like USA and UK have, so that if we put all these atypical cases to the national database, the other doctors will be benefited by referring it. So, and we must use point of contact test. This recently I was presenting in South Zone Epicon, like here. I, last week it was South Zone Epicon in our Vijag, comprising of all South states. And uh, there I presented the point of contact test in fever, that is newer biological markers for diagnosis and prognosis in acute febrile illness. That was my uh, talk there. So here I must emphasize that point of contact tests are very good, especially when the physician is alone in a small setup where you don't have much backup. Then point of contact test along with this uh, uh, rapid uh, diagnostic tests are very important, which are PCR based, which are now made in India, I will show you. Some important investigations, this you can just see arterial blood glass, rapid diagnostic test as I told and two sets of uh, this culture you must take from two sets from different venipuncture sites, then ultrasound, 
then focus that is uh, focused uh, ultrasound to diagnose where is the problem ct chest and abdomen and you nowadays in all icu admissions we are using apache 2 sofa q sofa news and mu scores q sofa is not very much uh, favored with the current guidelines of critical care so this is the made in india tropical uh, fever panel kit it is only 1700 uh, rupees and it should be used by most of the er and icus because this really helps to diagnose dengue chikungunya plasmodium rickettsi salmonella west nile zika and leptospira instantly results within 35 to 45 minutes you get and this is a pcr based case test so it is very good actually and it is uh, indian this is the other one biofire this is a french company which makes and cost is almost 25000 rupees so but this can detect almost 16 tests okay but many of them may not be used in India, like Marburg, West Nile. So I prefer true PCR kit. In Arnforce, we use true PCR kit. In bigger hospitals, common hospital, we have in ICU's biofire system. But this is costly. So protocolized treatment is always better rather than going haphazard treatment. This was also discussed in Surviving Sepsis Campaign in 2021 by International Society of Critical Care Medicine. And ARDS we should handle by Berlin's definition. KDGO guideline we should follow. Thrombocytopenia platelet neutrophil ratio neutrophil lymphocyte ratio i must emphasize neutrophil lymphocyte ratio nlr is very very good it is just simply one uh, differentiated uh, dlc count differentiated leukocyte count you take with that neutrophil versus lymphocyte you take the ratio and that is very important going to give you prognostic markers similarly lactate procalcitonin these are also very important especially lactate when you are uh, resuscitating patient in shock with sepsis if a lactate rise is poor prognosis Procalcitonin is excellent for both diagnosis and prognosis. When you are treating a case of PEO, you don't know whether it is bacterial, viral, do a procalcitonin. If it is less than 0.2, then you can think that it is probably non-infectious, some other cause, maybe rheumatological or other cause. Okay, procalcitonin, prognostically very important because whenever you are de-escalating with antibiotics, you want to de-escalate, then you use a procalcitonin, excellent marker. And you must remember procalcitonin doesn't go to the bloodstream as such. In a healthy person, there should be no procalcitonin. Only when there is a sepsis, procalcitonin is getting secreted and that goes to the system. This I was talking about neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. This is very important. This is I call it NLR meter, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio meter. When the neutrophil versus lymphocyte, you get around 9 to 18. Like suppose your neutrophil is 90 or 80 and your lymphocyte is 4 or 5. It is a bad prognostic marker. This was extensively... Uh, proven in COVID time and also in dengue fever also we uh, see very good results. So just do an NLR and serial NLR every day if you do, you can really know your patient is progressing or not. ARDS, uh, uh, we follow this ARDS protocol, is Berlin protocol, we all know that when your PO2 by FI2 is less than 300 in X-ray bilateral opacities and you know that is non-cardiogenic uh, failure. Uh, then you can, uh, and uh, this is KDGO guideline for kidney injuries. This everybody knows that's KDGO stage 1, 2, 3 failures and how to manage AKI. Okay, but remember, AKI, we should not jump for dialysis or renal depression therapy. Recently, 10 days back, my mother had diarrhea, post uh, diarrhea, acute renal failure. I brought her to Bhaijak from Bhubaneswar and I thought she may require dialysis because she was her creatinine was going up till 6, but still we prevented. Now she is in 2, creatinine 2, doing well. So that is uh, my next in Calcutta Epicon. My talk is on uh, ARF, uh, management of ARF, whether we should do dialysis or that I'll be going in Epicon Calcutta. So uh, what we do, fluid resuscitation in ICUs, we usually use lot of non-invasive tests, whether the patient is fluid responsive or not responsive. If you are giving too much fluid, especially in sepsis or dengue cases, most probably you will overload the lungs and heart with lot of fluids and patient will have frank pulmonary edema. So that is why, there is a lot of trials, but there are trials which shows that when we give bolus fluid versus restrictive fluid and uh, with the protocols like ultrasound and IVC diameter, still uh, the difference of uh, survivability is not much. You see this graph, overall survival between standard group where you are giving too much fluid or between restrictive where we do hemodynamic management and fluid, the total outcome at the end of days like 30 or 60 days is not much. So this is what I do extensively in my eyes. In most of the cases when I give fluid, I just take, when I give fluid at the end of one or two hours, I put the probe, ultrasound probe on the lungs, see the A lines. A lines are nothing, they are basically 
reaps reap your own uh, this patient's reap which gives a artifact if you see this a lines like horizontal lines that means the patient's lung is dry moment you get b lines like torch light like shadows moment you put the ultrasound probe you get lot of torch line like shadows that means it has got fluids you must stop giving iv fluids this is the basic thing we do to uh, see the fluid responsiveness and this is what little advanced if you have a little bit of training you just see the inferior vena cava ivc just put the ultrasound probe on the right side of the uh, chest that is to see the liver and you can clearly see the horizontal uh, in inferior vena cava and put your uh, uh, meter like the m mode uh, meter and you see the distance between ivc during systole or diastole that is the largest diameter you can see the right side picture the largest diameter of ivc and the least diameter of ivc divide it and if the percentage is more than 12 percent you can give fluid that is fluid responsiveness so this is what in my icu i am doing a ivc assessment giving while giving fluid so similarly <coughs> Yeah, uh, when you see a uh, patient is hemodynamically unstable, whether you see this patient is fluid responsive or unresponsive. If fluid responsive, by all your tests which I told, then give fluid. If unresponsive, then you do other tests like lactate, skin modeling, differential PCO2, SCBO2. They are very good markers, and you give accordingly fluid challenge. Okay. So point of care ultrasound fluid resuscitation guide is very very interesting and very important nowadays. We cannot bypass ultrasound in ICU. I that is why I always uh, wherever I go I recommend that we must follow the blue protocol or all the ICU should have uh, ultrasound. All most of the trainees should be very good with ultrasound. It's a very co very low cost machine. My ultrasound is a made in China ultrasound because I work now after arm source in a missionary hospital. My ultrasound is only one lakh rupees. And last seven years I am working with this. It has got eco probe also. And uh, even DVT also with a flat probe we can rule out. So it is very important. So this is just uh, I have already discussed A line and B line, IVC parameters. So these are all important. So initial resuscitative therapy is the cornerstone. Initial we must give IV fluid. Saline is still best. If you get balanced crystal out, uh, then it is good. But most of the ICUs we are using salines. Uh, then empirical antibiotic. There are many confusions. Many uh, old professors they say that don't use antibiotic unless you are very sure. But as per ISCCM guideline, patients should get uh, antibiotic within one hour. And either beta-lactam antibiotic or a beta-lactam BLBI or a carbapenem should be the choice of antibiotic within one hour. And within three hours, you send the blood for culture. And lot of trials, Merino trial in 2018 has told piperacillin tazobactam is not inferior to carbapenem because piperacillin tazobactam is much cheaper. Now, of course, generic carbapenems are there. I have a doubt whether generic is that good or not. I don't use generic medicines much because I had bad experience in armed forces because government is now forcibly giving us generic, which is not good. So when the patient requires uh, kidney, I mean renal replacement therapy, you can go with a peritoneal dialysis. In resource poor setting, when I in different military hospitals, I was alone and there was no CRRT facility. I have done a uh, lot of uh, peritoneal dialysis and we got uh, saved many patients with peritoneal dialysis alone. If you have, now we are using CRRT, so we do CVVH also. So but I told you as the example, if you are doing too early, there are lot of things in AKI where you should go, where you actually get a hyperkalemia or your pH of the patient is less than 7.1 despite of uh, best of the therapies, all these conditions, then only you should go for renal replacement therapy. Otherwise, conservative approach, uh, try to address the defects, AKI will resolve within three to four days. So acute liver failure, nothing much. Basically, acute liver failure is organ specific. You try to save most of the organs and hemodynamics patient will recover if he has to recover. There is not much of... Uh, thing in acute liver failure management. Steroid therapy, this I must tell that surviving section 2021 guideline for adults with septic shocks and ongoing requirement of vasopressor therapy. If vasopressors you are using, you are using uh, all 2, 3, dobutamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, everything you are using, then you can go with uh, vasopressors, corticosteroid, hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone. But quality of evidence is moderate. Severe dengue as of now, uh, the AIMS guideline which Delhi we are following, they have told not to use steroids, but I am against it. Recently in AIMS, uh, Bhuvaneshwar also, we had a big fight with uh, my friend uh, um, HOD med medicine and uh, we um, in SCB also, we all supported that we should give steroid. And even uh, Dr. Bhalla sir who is here I think present, I saw his name is there. He also uh, in Chandigarh in Midwa study. Uh, he has recommended that we should use steroid. He has used one gram of methylprednisolone in acute febrile illness or severe dengue patients. It really saved a uh, lot of lives. 
So I am in favor of using steroids in severe sepsis. Heat trial acetaminophen, it did not statistically made any difference, but patient will be pain free if you are giving IV paracetamol. So management, per, this is my favorite, uh, this actually came from Journal of Physician of India, JAPI, they have published a book on acute febrile illness. Uh, Muruganathan sir, Professor Muruganathan sir has actually authored that. And here doxycycline is a very good drug in acute undifferentiated fever, the first line. Actually I also use, because doxycycline covers most of the viruses also, bacteria and many of the uh, 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 things it is drug of choice like scrub typhus and in falciparum malaria along with falsigo you have to use doxycycline as per recommendation you have to use two drugs because falciparum has got lot of resistance especially complicated vivox also when you are using IV uh, falsigo you must use doxy also along with that. So this is a case study acute uh, reversible heart failure. I got a case of acute reversible heart failure because of acute mitral regurgitation due to acute scrub. Patient suddenly desaturated when I did the NICO bedside, severe MR was there. And we started with steroid, diffidox, that is doxycycline. And this case was presented in Asia Pacific Intensive Care, Singapore. And uh, ISCCM also I presented this case in ISCCM uh, 2020 and in uh, SIDSCON also. So there are some questions because PG students are not much, so there is no point. So Susugamosi triangle is this triangle where the uh, Susugamosi, uh, that is scrub typhus is very much dominant. And uh, well felix test, these are all basically MCQs not required. So this I wanted to show. This I had a quiz question also on this, that uh, lychee fruit in UP and Bihar. This uh, they call in Bihar and UP chumki fever. So this is a encephalopathy ward, acute encephalopathy ward you can see. So there was, till now it is a, um, actually nobody knows. Though we discussed in the quiz the lychee fruit contains MCPG, which we told. But actually whether it is a JE virus, because when they actually did PCR, they got 17.7 JEV scrub and dengue also. So this is another interesting case, hemophagocytosis nowadays very much interest. Most of the um, uh, API and tropical disease, uh, CMS, they will have one uh, speaker at least on hemophagocytosis, a uh, macrophage. Uh, 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 HLH diagnosis. So this basically clinical features of fever, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy and confusion will be there and that is basically hemophagocytic syndrome and the classical this thing is rise in ferritin. So but rise in ferritin we must remember that can also uh, a very good uh, clinical diagnosis for adult onset steel disease. AOSD also actually one of the thing is ferritin. However, uh, this is very important, rarely we get such cases and you did not get any infection, any lab culture, everything will be negative and this patient uh, uh, goes into very rapid course and usually dies, so life saving is steroid. So my last slide is 9 commandments, take home points in acute febrile illness in ICU receives. Detailed travel history is very important, patient what food, drink, animal contact, very important, sexual encounters, vital link, local epidemiology pattern we must know, complete detailed physical examination, point of contact of blood, urine, fluid test, including the newer PCR kits you should use, okay. And time is life, most critical, fastest and accurate diagnosis is vital, syndromic management is most important, aggressive fluid management, early antimicrobial or antibiotics, airway support, cooling measures, management of acute kidney injury, liver injury, coagulation disease are very important, communication with the next of, this is where we fail, most of the time we patient keep the patient in ICU or emergency room, we don't talk with the relatives and after some time there is some problem. We know that it comes in the newspaper, the doctor, I also faced this, but we have to talk in between or we have to send some representative, our paramedics who can go from the ICU outside and talk to the relative, patient is in this condition and these are the probability of survival, we are doing this. So communication with the next of kin about the disease severity outcome is very, very important, especially patient comes consciousness with high grade fever, after some time he will die with ARDS. So they will shout and create problems, we must address those issues. Rare diagnosis, rarely correct as our professors used to tell that may not hold any good anymore nowadays especially with such international traveling, international uh, this, uh, people are uh, migrating so you can have some genotic any other uh, disease at your uh, emergency room or ICU suddenly and you cannot, uh, you should be like Dr. Arun Kumar who actually got the Nipah fever diagnosed very fast. I was posted in Kerala that time. So Jai Hind and love from Bhaijak, this is the only three dimensional navy of uh, India where we have nuclear submarines, we have got stealth class warships and aircraft carrier, all three and uh, are there in Bhaijak. So anybody who will come to Bhaijak in any of the CMEs, most welcome and definitely we would like to have you there. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Zatta for an excellent talk. It is a very tough topic, acute febrile illness.
especially in ICU, you are in dilemma what to do because in ICU the patient is already in a moribund condition. So over and above, febrile illness complicates any disease. So thank you very much. If there are any questions. So, uh, most of the modern ICUs we see that they quickly insert central line on the first day itself. So what is your thought on this? Actually, sir, there are a lot of um, uh, papers on this. Actually, sir, I was also, when I was doing training also in base hospital uh, and uh, Sabdarjang, I was also, my favorite this thing was central line. And then I used to put with that uh, IV saline bottle only, we used to put the poor setup and we used to see the CVP. But off late, CVP is not a this thing because there are a lot of conditions like right heart conditions can give a false CVP, a rise or fall. So nowadays, uh, CVP is the uh, predictability of a real uh, fluid response, you know, only 70%. The best thing is still now, and the easiest thing is ultrasound guided USG or you can do a, a, a fluid challenge test with leg raising test or physiological uh, leg raising test or you can uh, give 100 ml of bolus fluid and see with an ultrasound the IVC refill and uh, changes in the uh, LV uh, the, uh, output. These are better markers. Though I also still CVP. My, uh, basically when I work in casualty, if I get a call, I go to casualty, put a CVP, put a follies give lot of fluid, if urine comes, that is best, I am happy and auscultate the lungs. Still I go by that, but in a conference sake, academically, I must say that, that is not as good as that, but in resource poor setting, we have to do this, CVP, uh, Follis catheter and a stethoscope with bilateral lung crepes, uh, good fluid marker. I mean, you can save the patient. Even most of the critical care guidelines, when teachers also say that, first give lot of fluid and then take out the fluid later with the diuretics. So that is best because if you are early phase, if you don't give fluid and antibiotics, chances that you may lose the patient. Yeah, actually roll of platelets in DIC is very less actually. Now the current recommendation is almost gone. I am also nowadays, I used to give, now I am after all this conference, attending IACCM guidelines and all, I have almost left now giving platelet. Even less than 10,000, I am not transfusing because it increases more antibody mediated killing. The platelets. So I don't give platelets anymore unless patient has got, uh, even if dengue we get lot of cases every day. That is our um, bread and butter of most of the, our hospitals in Andhra. So dengue, what we do, we wait. Even if it is less than 10,000, I do a uh, uh, bleeding time, clotting time and I repeatedly do the tunicate test. Put the uh, blood pressure cuff, inflate more than 10 millimeter of systolic, wait and then see the uh, petiches, count the petiches. I still do it and that is a better marker and I don't give platelet. I am very restrictive of platelet use. Thank you. Sir.